So if we can go back to the year 1642, a very brilliant man came on the scene, and his name was Isaac Newton. And I don't know if I can completely do justice to everything that he contributed to the world throughout his life in his scientific work, but I'm definitely going to give it a try. But before we start talking about Isaac Newton, I want us to go back a little bit and talk about a guy named Galileo. Now, Galileo was a very influential philosopher, physicist, scientist. A lot of his works were involved in planetary motion. One of his main thoughts and discoveries was that the Earth is not the center of the universe. And he supported this theory, which actually got him in a lot of trouble. And he was put on house arrest until the day he died because of his thoughts on the motion of the planets and the fact that the Earth is not the center. Anyway, Galileo died in 1642. Um, I believe it was in January of 1642. But that same year, on Christmas Day, later, Isaac Newton was born. And Isaac Newton, throughout his life, built on top of the works of Galileo and many other scientists and physicists that came before him. And Isaac Newton was actually very modest in all of his accomplishments, and he was somewhat reluctant to take praise for a lot of the things that he did. One of Isaac Newton's uh, more famous quotes is, if I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And no doubt Galileo was one of those giants that Isaac Newton was talking about. And we are going to get into the thoughts of Isaac Newton and forces, which is what he's most well known for, which is his thoughts on universal gravitation and what we call now Newton's laws were his three principles that described all motion. But I want to talk about some other areas of his life first. And one of Isaac Newton's most famous contributions to the world is his creation of calculus. Now, when Isaac Newton was about the age of 24, he started asking some pretty deep and intense questions about motion and the universe and the way things move. And the math of that day didn't exactly answer the questions that he was asking. It wasn't robust enough. So in private, he started to develop this new type of mathematics that would help answer the questions that he was asking. And we call this now calculus. And because he created calculus and he kept it a secret, he came up with a bunch of interesting thoughts on motion and the way the universe worked. And these thoughts were revolutionary. And he was able to prove all this stuff mathematically with calculus. The only problem was no one else in the world knew what calculus was. So if he was going to present his information to his peers and to the scientific community, he had to put it in a mathematical form that people understood. So he would take all of his calculus equations and all his understandings that he derived from calculus, and he converted it into geometry and algebra so that all of his peers could completely understand what he was talking about. Now, the truth is, this creation of calculus is one of Isaac Newton's biggest controversies in his life. And the reason behind that is because he wasn't the only person that invented calculus. This guy named Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz also invented calculus. So Isaac Newton in secret created calculus when he was 24, kept it under his hat, but he didn't publish any work about calculus until 1693, which was 27 years after he first started using calculus. And even then when he did publish that work, he didn't give a complete explanation until 11 years afterwards. So 38 years after Isaac Newton started using calculus, he never completely explained it to the public what he was doing. But Leibniz, who was independently studying math on his own as well and derived calculus, he published his work in 1684, which is nine years before Isaac Newton published anything using calculus. So there's this big, huge debate on who invented calculus? Was it Isaac Newton or was it Leibniz? Now, the Royal Society in, in England, they sided with Newton and said that Leibniz was basically stealing Isaac Newton's work. And Leibniz basically wasn't going to take that, and he kept fighting back and saying that he invented calculus and Isaac Newton was not the originator of the invention of calculus. And these two were basically bitter rivals till both of their deaths. Now, today's society can look back on all their notes and look at the timeline, and it seems like they both developed calculus independently of each other. Now, today, people who learn calculus, they learn it using Leibniz's technique and methods and his notations that he created. It seems to be a lot simpler than Isaac Newton's notations. But beyond just understanding calculus, 
Isaac Newton was also an extremely religious man, which is very rare for people to understand about science today. A lot of scientists were very, very religious and thought philosophically about things. A lot of times in the past, if you were a scientist, you were also a philosopher, or maybe you were a very religious person. And Newton was not afraid to mix science and religion together. He actually saw his religion as a reason to pursue science. He wanted to study science because he thought that understanding science would help him know more about who God was. And Isaac Newton actually kept a lot of his religious beliefs to himself because his Christianity that he had in his day didn't exactly line up with mainstream Christianity. You see, Isaac Newton didn't believe everything that the Church of England believed about the Bible. For example, he didn't believe in the Trinity, and he also thought that worshiping Jesus was a form of idolatry, which are two things that went directly in the face of the Church of England. But if Isaac Newton divulged this information out to the public, chances are he probably would have lost his job at the college. So Isaac Newton wrote about religion, but he kept all those journals personal and he never published them out there into the world. And he was able to keep doing his work even though his religious beliefs didn't line up with the Church of England. And it's actually said that Isaac Newton wrote just as much about religion as he did theology in his own personal journals. But one of the more interesting things that Isaac Newton wrote about was his thoughts on the end times. And a lot of these thoughts about Isaac Newton and the end times have kind of been skewed out of proportion. And a lot of things they, that people say today about Isaac Newton in the end times are not exactly true. You see, Isaac Newton wrote about the end times in the year 2060. So a lot of people saw that and thought, well, there you go. Isaac Newton predicted that the end of the world will be the year 2060. But if you read what he said in his context, that's not exactly what he was saying. So basically, Isaac Newton was looking at a bunch of biblical prophecies, and he took a lot of those biblical prophecies, and he calculated when he thought the end of the world would be using dates and times and time periods of biblical prophecy. And what he said was, I don't see why the world would end before the year 2060. It very well could be after the year 2060, but he saw no reason for it to be before that year. And also, Isaac Newton wrote afterwards that he doesn't necessarily like it when people predict like the exact day that the world is going to end. And the reason he didn't like this is because everyone who did it was always wrong. And we still see that today. Every once in a while, someone comes up and says the end of the world is going to be, you know, such and such day for one reason or another. And it seems to always prove to be wrong. I remember back when people thought that the world was going to end in 2012, because that's when the Mayan calendar ended. And you know, a lot of people are worried about all that. So anyway, Isaac Newton isn't trying to predict when the end of the world is. And one of his main reasons why he doesn't like when people do that is because he feels like it puts the Bible under scrutiny. And Isaac Newton loved the Bible. He loved studying the Bible. And when people would do things that put the Bible under scrutiny, he took offense to that. And so it doesn't seem logical to think that Isaac Newton is predicting when the world is going to end. He's just saying, I don't see why it should happen before the year 2060. But he also said, only God knows when the world's going to end. So it seems to say that Isaac Newton wasn't exactly predicting when the world would end. He's just saying, I don't see why it would happen before 2060. It very well could be much later than 2060. But he's also putting his own thoughts on this and saying, I'm not really predicting anything here. So a lot of people have taken his thoughts on the end of the world and twisted them, manipulated them, and skewed them to something that they're not. So anytime you hear someone say that Isaac Newton predicted the world would end in 2060, you can, you know, you can go and correct them with that. But another interesting thing that Isaac Newton was involved in was a thing called alchemy. Now, alchemy is somewhat of a dark pseudoscience that was very popular in his day. And alchemy is actually the precursor to chemistry. And while alchemy has a suspicious and sort of a mysterious reputation around it, a lot of the things that alchemists did have now become useful in the world of chemistry. Now, alchemists were trying to do a lot of things by mixing and mashing chemicals together in different forms and fashions. One of the main goals of alchemists was to take some sort of common metal 
and try to turn it into gold by putting it through some sort of process. And another thing they wanted to do was create a special elixir that gave people immortality. And many alchemists thought that they could perfect the human body and the human soul through this process of alchemy and understanding how to combine chemicals together in the perfect form and fashion. Now, alchemy was really popular in China, India, Muslim countries, and in all of Europe. But the European and the Islamic alchemists, they created some very basic laboratory techniques and theories that are still used today. And a lot of the alchemists, they followed this ancient Greek philosophy that it, everything is made up out of four different elements, and that's earth, water, fire, and air. And they thought if you put the perfect combination of those four elements together, well, then you can create whatever you want. And one thing about alchemists is they like to work in secrecy. And often in their notebooks and their journals, they would use cryptic symbols and write using some sort of wordplay to keep their work to themselves and kind of secretive because they didn't want everyone to know the direction they were going with their science. I mean, because there's a lot of money to be made if you're the only person who can turn normal metals into gold or create a special elixir that gives you immortality. There's a big profit to be made, so it was very secretive. And a lot of times, alchemists would show up in a town and say that they have the solution to figure out how to create gold, and then they have the way to create this magic elixir, and they would collect a bunch of people's money in the town saying that I am going to create all this gold for you, and then they'd leave town. Anyway, no one ever really completely figured this whole making gold and creating a magic elixir out. But Isaac Newton, whenever he was studying alchemy, he wasn't necessarily trying to make gold or create some sort of magic elixir. He just saw it as another form of science that he can use just to understand everything. And alchemy is about 10% of Isaac Newton's writings. And he worked in alchemy for about 30 years of his life. So all of his alchemy work spanned a long period of his life. And he was constantly revisiting these thoughts in alchemy and trying to understand how you can combine chemicals and elements to create different chemicals and elements. But if you think about it, Isaac Newton and his involvement with alchemy makes perfect sense. He's an extremely curious person who wants to understand everything. And the fact that he was also very religious and so some sort of spiritual dark science wouldn't necessarily scare Isaac Newton, but he can also use his scientific principles and mind to try and understand more about the universe using this different type of science called alchemy. But Isaac Newton's most famous moment in his life is sort of his eureka moment whenever he started to really understand what gravity was and how it worked. Now, the legend goes that in 1666, Newton was sitting underneath an apple tree and an apple fell on top of his head. And at that moment, he understood how gravity worked. Now, people today know that that's not true, but there is actually some truth to the apple falling out of the apple tree story. A lot of people dismiss it and say, ah, oh, that never happened. But there is actually some writing evidence that the apple falling out of the apple tree, it just didn't happen in the way that legend goes where it fell on top of his head. Now it's documented that Isaac Newton was thinking about gravity very deeply for a very long period of time, many years. And from looking at historical documents, what seems to have happened was Isaac Newton was in a garden and there's an apple tree in the garden and he saw an apple fall from the apple tree. He just observed it happening. And he says it never fell to the left or to the right or upwards, but it always fell to the earth's center. And because of this, he figured that there must be some sort of pooling power connected with matter. So every he said everything that had matter must have some sort of pooling power. So the earth is a large chunk of matter and so the earth is pulling the apple towards it. But he also said, if that is the case, that all things that have matter have a pulling power, that must mean that the apple is also pulling the earth upwards. Now, the fact that the apple is a much smaller mass means it has a much smaller pulling power. So while the earth is moving upwards towards the apple, it's such a small movement that there's no way to measure it. And because the earth is such a greater mass than the apple, it's very easy to see that the apple is moving. But he said that pulling power must always be pulling towards the center of the mass, or in this case, the center of the earth. And he also made another observation is the fact that this pooling power between the apple and the earth, it acts over a distance. There's not any sort of touching or physical contact between these two forces or between these two objects. 
and that force that's pulling them doesn't require any sort of contact. It, it works over a distance. And he realized that this gravitational force that's pulling the apple down can act at such a great distance that it can even affect the movement of the moon. So he was able to connect this gravitational force with the motion of the moon's orbit. Now, Isaac Newton didn't necessarily discover gravity. A lot of people understood that there was some sort of pulling force to the earth, but they didn't understand that it extended over a great distance. And Isaac Newton said that the gravitational force follows what's called the inverse square law. And the inverse square law says that the greater the distance, the less force that you're going to experience. But the force doesn't change linearly, it actually changes exponentially. So if you're twice as far away from the Earth, you're actually gonna experience one fourth of the gravitational force. And that's basically the principle of the inverse square law. You might be further away, but you're not going to experience a linear change in force, but more so an exponential change in force. And one of the things about Newton in this discovery was that he didn't just theorize it, but he was able to mathematically prove what he was talking about. He was able to prove that the moon and the earth experienced a gravitational force between each other and that it followed the inverse square law. And he did this by using the inverse square law in his thoughts on gravity gravitational force, and he was able to use those equations that he created to accurately calculate the orbit of the moon. And the reason why this is important is because it didn't just explain why the moon orbits the earth, it explained why the earth orbited the sun, and why all the planets orbited the sun, and why Jupiter's moons orbit Jupiter. He created a process that we can use in any celestial body, any sort of planet, star, movement in the universe, we can use Newton's calculations to accurately calculate an object's orbit. And he called this theory the universal gravitational theory, or the theory of universal gravitation. And he wrote about this in his most important writing of his life, which is called the Philosophie Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which is Latin for Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. In this writing right here, the Principia is what it's typically called, is his crown jewel work. And he wrote it in 1687 and revised it twice, and the final revision was done in 1726. He just basically went through and made a few minor mathematical calculation fixes that were in error on his first edition. And the Principia is actually the foundation for what we have as classical mechanics today or Newtonian mechanics. This is where he wrote about his theory of universal gravitation and also Newton's three laws, what he's most famously known for, what everyone learns about in school is Newton's three laws. And those three laws, while it may not, un it may not seem like a big deal when you're first learning it, it was a big deal in revolutionizing how we understood an object's movement. Now, when the Principia came out, it astounded the scientific community and everyone was just blown away by it. They didn't all quite understand everything about it, but they did understand that it was extremely important and it took them a long time to completely wrap their head around what Isaac Newton was thinking, which is a difficult thing to do because he's a very, very smart guy. And it took a while to accept his theories. And then later on in life, he wrote another book called Optics, which is a study of light. But back to the Principia, we still use a lot of the math and the science that Isaac Newton wrote about in the Principia today. In fact, the astronauts that go to the moon all the engineers and the calculations that go behind that are based off of the Principia. Now, the only time that the Principia has really been rivaled is whenever we start talking about objects that are extremely small and on the atomic level. At that point, Newtonian mechanics kind of falls apart and that's where we get quantum mechanics, where we needed basically a different type of physics to understand the atom. And then Newtonian mechanics also falls apart when you start talking about things moving extremely fast, such as the speed of light. And that's where we needed a different type of physics. And Albert Einstein was the guy that came up with that in his theory of relativity. But all in all, Isaac Newton revolutionized the science world in his understanding of planetary motion and his understanding of just motion and objects in general. And even his studies in light were extremely important and revolutionary to science. He created his calculus and he wasn't afraid to mix his religion with his science, it probably helped motivate him to actually study harder and want to learn more. 
And he wasn't afraid to jump into any sort of weird type of science as well, including alchemy. And while Isaac Newton was very humble and said that if he sees further, it's because he's standing on the shoulders of giants, truly it turns out that Isaac Newton is one of the giants.